What are you talking about? How do you know what she went through as a kid? Did she talk to you? Once. One night. I didn't really understand. Her dad left when she was like 12 years old. She basically raised her brothers and sisters on her own. Hold on, what? She has brothers and sisters? I guess so. And she's the oldest. And at some point, she burned bridges with everyone. Forever. Oh, wow. Well. Did, did I know this? I kind of remember, but it feels like a blur. Have we talked about this before? Did I forget that too? Hmm. That's not what's important right now. You know, Jan, I don't think that Marie has anyone. Not really. She doesn't want to. She can't. She doesn't know how to trust. True. That is the one thing that's beyond her reach. But it's not beyond ours. We need to trust each other, otherwise we're screwed. You understand? Of course I understand. I've spent years trying to get her to pay attention to me. And I don't feel like fighting all the time. Not against you, anyway. We don't have to anymore. What? You mean, now that she's fucking dying? No, I mean, we can decide to do things differently. We don't have to play by her rules, where everyone's out for everyone. Kill or be killed. I think that's... I don't know. It might be her history, but it doesn't have to be ours. I'm not even sure she even believes it herself, actually. I'd rather believe that there are people I can always count on. And that they can count on me, because I love them and I care for them. People like you, Didi Du. Is she... crying? Sorry. I don't know what's going on with me. I'm scared, you know? For Mom. I don't want her to die. Well, right now, she's still alive. And you know her, she's not going down easy. I don't think you're anything like a lobster. I think lobsters are disgusting. Is that right? Me too, come to think of it. Ugh, oh, crap. What? Is it the doctors? No, look. Alex? You should answer. Are you sure? Are you gonna be okay? Ask me again and I'll slap you. Of course I'll be okay. You're coming right back, aren't you? You bet I am, dude. Little sis. I don't know what would have happened between your dad and I, if you were still here. Would we have agreed on how to raise you, the kind of values to impart? Respect others, be curious and open-minded, and try to beautify the world. Except racists and boomers who drive SUVs, obviously. I don't think we would have had any trouble getting along in the end. We were on the same wavelength. I trusted him 100% from the first day I met him. He's got that little something in his eyes. This uncanny kindness that's always there. Got damage, you know. Okay, pretend I didn't say anything, huh? Hello, Alex. How are you doing, Alex? Oh, I'm so glad to hear from you, Alex. Did you take it? Uh, I have no idea what you're talking about. I know exactly what he's talking about. I just have no desire to talk about it right now. The house. Astrid's dollhouse. It used to be in my office and now it isn't. And I need it for work. I'm using it as a reference for level design. Can I call you later? Hold on. Where am I right now? Hmm, I guess I wandered into a decommissioned part of the hospital. Ooh, it's kind of spooky. No, you cannot call me later. It's easy. Just tell me if you have it. It will take two seconds. Your dad is getting on my nerves. I'm sorry, but it's true. 
All right. Okay, come on. Keep your cool. Try and be mindful. I have no idea where that house is. And since we're talking about last week, actually, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have showed up unannounced. I don't know what came over me. What does that mean? Wasn't it nice to see each other again? You and I never got to talk about some stuff. The birds and bees, how grown-ups cuddle, although we did have the chance. But I was never comfortable with the idea. Marie wasn't a fan of mother-daughter conversations. When I had my first period, do you know what she told me? Just make sure you don't stay in the couch. So I guess as a result, I'm not too good with personal matters either. But still... I have a fond memory of that moment. I had become a woman, just like her. It was astonishing, almost an animalistic feeling. I felt strong, powerful. <sighs> it was very nice, but it was also completely stupid. Don't say that. Why are you saying that? You know why. We can't be doing this. Things are different between us now. And... They don't have to be. Things could even be better. Stop it. You know I'm right. Deep down you know it. Everything that happened to us, it helped us. There was a reason. Maybe all of this means we are supposed to come back together. Stronger. Bullshit. Why? What about Pauline? Pauline is... great. I'll talk to her. It will be hard, but she'll understand. What will she understand? That your crazy ex has suddenly decided to return after dumping you, after she killed your... Don't even go there. That's a really stupid idea, Alex. People don't change. And you know how I am. I do. I've known since day one. We met in high school. As juniors, <laughs> it feels like a lifetime ago. We only had one class in common, film studies. And we had completely opposite tastes, but I immediately liked something about him. His high-speed internet. Hey, back in the day, it was a precious gift, especially in our podunk town. All of a sudden, you could pirate movies from all over the world. A dream. Yeah, I know what you're going to say. Piracy kills, blah, blah, blah. But that's only for the rich. When you're 16, you're poor, so it's okay. We spent hours on end in Alex's bedroom. I'm sure his parents thought we were having sex. Alex made an attempt once, but I wasn't interested at all at the time. I think that it scared me. Your dad didn't insist. That's one thing I like about him. Even as a teen, he was much less stupid than most guys. We watched tons of movies, lying on his bed, chomping on candy. I was obsessed with film. It felt like discovering a new world. And when I requested a boring three-hour movie, the next day, we would play a video game. Actually, it's not as lame as it sounds, I promise. Don't you think about it? Don't you miss it? Don't you want everything to be just like before? I think... Yes, I think I do. It's not too late. <sighs> you really think so? I know so. I'm on my way then. Like, now? Yes, shouldn't I? Yes, yes, come over. 
Wait for me, I'm coming. After all, why not? Maybe he's right. Maybe I was just wrong about all this. That wouldn't be the first time I screwed up. The three of us were so happy together. Maybe Alex and I can still be happy? Oh, wow. You know, my little phone, in life, you only have two ways out. Either escaping or disappearing. But sometimes you're unable to disappear. And escaping from yourself, well, that sure ain't easy. So, when that happens, in your opinion, what's left to do? We can try to find out together if you want. When Diane and I were little, Mary would tell us bedtime stories. She would make up animal fables with all kinds of mystery and conflict. Savage world, she called it. Female wolves, bears, or scorpions would find themselves in imminent danger, but they could always manage it on their own, swindling and betraying the boorish, idiotic males. Marie wanted us to be strong, courageous, and independent women, except it also made me a bit fearful of the world. Alex gifted me most of these books. It started as a joke, but as time passed, there were more and more. It goes back to the film studies days in high school. We barely knew one another. The teacher had prompted us to write a few scenes from a comedy, and I couldn't do it. And then one morning, your dad gave me a book and told me, check this out since you're so not funny. Bring the funny, the essential companion for the comedy screenwriter. <laughs> It made me laugh. And, uh, well, truth be told, I was charmed that he cared about me. So I read his dumb book. And uh, believe it or not, the next few scenes I wrote were really funny. <laughs> but then it turned into a habit. Every time I had an issue, Alex would find the book to address it. Some of the worst titles, too. Um, how to win friends and influence people. The subtle art of not giving a fuck. Uh, who moved my cheese? I was reading them casually, but they still helped me move on. Alex would call it the emergency library. <laughs> Every problem has a book, he said. But when I found myself alone, the library didn't work anymore.
At first, I stayed in the apartment for days. I wouldn't go outside. I barely recognized my own voice when I opened the door for food deliveries. I could have disappeared. No one would have known. Yet, amid the silence, if you listen carefully, you can hear some things. The air traveling through the lungs, the bowels gurgling, the teeth grinding, even a heart beating. That much is clear now. In fact, Alex and Marie are like two sides of the same coin for me. Alex was my crutch, my unwavering support. I came to believe that I would crumble without him. Marie was a model of strength, of courage and determination. Everyone admires her, but she is completely unattainable and I was dependent on her as much as him. Unable to manage on my own, but that was before. I guess you understand now, my little fawn. Your dad and I separated. And for the first time in my life, I was living alone at 34 years old. I had no idea how to do that. And he didn't fix everything. But come to think of it, it may be the reason I began looking for who I really was. I think I just figured out why I love movies so much. When I was a teenager, my life didn't seem real. I couldn't say for sure that I existed, but in movies, people had pure and intense emotions. I loved that. Any fiction was a documentary to me. When I found myself alone, I fell back into that zone. I watched hundreds of movies, obscure comedies, blockbusters, Absurd schlock. I was looking for a template that would explain to me how to feel. Except it didn't work this time. I needed more. I lived surrounded with cardboard boxes for months. I was unable to open them. It was physically impossible, but it didn't bother me much. I've never been a homemaker anyway. Also, if I had an off day, I could always blame it on those boxes, instead of blame it on the life that was put away in those boxes. Do you remember this cup? Every morning you would drink your hot cocoa from it. I had to take it out of the dishwasher so many times. You wanted nothing else. It was in a box for a while. I thought about it sometimes when I thought about you. It was there. One day I pulled it out of one of the boxes. I wanted a hot cocoa and it slipped out of my hands. skipped a beat in that moment. I held my breath for one second. And then... nothing. I just picked up the pieces one by one and threw them in the garbage. I wondered 
whether I was a monster for not feeling devastated. But now I know that I'm not. I stayed strong. And it turns out that being able to do that changed everything. That day I realized that I was strong and that I could do it alone. From the day you died, I had been sleeping a lot. I was still tired when I woke up, but at least it passed the time. Then everything changed. Sleeplessness kicked in. I spent my nights trying to understand, what am I still doing here? Then, I understood. I turned on my computer and I started typing. Not a soap opera episode, like I was writing before you died. It was something personal, and I think it was important. I was surprised to feel the desire to write, but now I understand how priceless it was. It allowed me to switch roles. I was no longer the grieving mother, or the young divorcee, or the daughter of. I was writing. I was becoming an author. I was inventing a reality that was just as valid as another. You know, I was telling the truth earlier when I said that there were only two ways out in life. But whether you escape or disappear, in the end you're doing the same thing. Now I understand that I had to find another way. And complete solitude allowed me to face the void and to rewrite myself. It was the only way for me to change completely from the ground up. you want everything to be just like before. Alex and I can reinvent ourselves. I know that we can, but that's going to require a lot more work. I would love for things to work out that way, Alex, just like in the movies. But the scene when they get back together, the happy end, we all know that's not happening. Too bad. You're at least as sexy as Ryan Gosling. Yeah, and I definitely have better abs. I noticed that the other day. Is that new? See? You're missing out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry things ended the way they did between us. I left because I was losing my bearings. And I felt like you were also going off track. You know, trying to convince us that we would be okay. I was trying to help you. 
That's the problem. <sighs> you couldn't have. I was too... too sad. I was unable to listen. I couldn't keep leaning so much on you. I couldn't stand it. I had reached a breaking point. If I didn't make a big change, I would have... But I was not allowed to die. I had no right. So I tried living. All the people who matter to me have something in common. They all taught me that I could live without someone else. Marie taught me that I could live without a father. That I could exist as a woman in a world created for men. But she never taught me what it was like to be loved. Alex taught me that I could live without Marie. All of a sudden, I was worth more than I thought. And she much less than I thought. But what he loved the most about me was that he could be there for me. I don't hold it against him. We are who we are. He loved me. But he didn't help me love myself. And then you were there. And you taught me the most important thing. You taught me that I could live, even without Marie, even without Alex, even without you. Without you. You know, I changed too. I believe you, Alex. So don't you think it may be a good time to try again? We can't try again if we're strangers to each other. Wow, that's a Nobel Wisdom Prize right there. <laughs> that's not even a thing. Exactly. You know... Oh, I don't know if I should tell him this, but... <sighs> I will always love you. And oftentimes I think to myself that we could start something new. We'd hop in the car and road trip through Ardèche. I would take off my flip-flops and rest my bare feet on the dashboard. And you would yell at me because that's nasty. That is definitely nasty. Oh, oh, nastier than your damn Tupperware up in the fridge? Nastier than your clumps of hair in the bathroom sink? Uh, probably not. <laughs> but then I realized that all of these are memories. Some are good, many are, but... Some are dreadful. Those memories with you, they're too much to handle. Which means I don't have a choice. I have to leave it all behind. You understand? Then, what about last week? Look, Alex, I don't want to hurt him, but... That's besides the point. I, I don't know why I did what I did. I don't even know why I went to your house. Because you wanted to see me. It's true. I'm telling you, I have no idea why I went. Maybe it was out of habit? I think that's one of the reasons why I fell in love with Alex. His way of figuring stuff out has always fascinated me. I'm woefully unable to make a decision without mulling over it for years. More than anything, I miss his faith. His faith in me. Of course I wanted to see you. I told you I did. Anyway, it was really stupid, and I probably hurt you. Come on, Jim, stop that. Last week you were happy. For the first time since I can remember. Oh, what would you know? We haven't seen each other in months. That is true. And it wasn't my call. You're the one who left. And I respected your choice. I learned how to live without you. And you showed up on my doorstep out of fucking nowhere? What am I supposed to think? Yeah. He's totally right about that. I'm sorry, Alex. I truly am. I, I know you're angry and... I'm not angry. 
But I was in a bad place. I didn't know what to do. I needed to see someone. Why not your sister, then? Or call her girlfriend? Even your mother, for that matter. I... You came to see me because I know what you are feeling. I understand your pain. Don't you think? No, I don't think so. You don't understand anything. <sighs> well, if you really understand, then why do I... Why the hell do I feel so alone? <sighs> no one can understand what I feel, ever. No one can tell me how to live with this, how to do this. It's a gaping hole in the fabric of life, and living with that big hole in you is, it's impossible. Do you remember your dollhouse? Marie gave it to you. She had built it herself in secret. It was really detailed. There were even miniature figurines of Alex and I for you to play with. Of course you remember. <laughs> you took to it immediately. You were making up all kinds of stories about daily life where you were the hero. It's true. I did it. I stole your house from Alex and threw it away. I don't know why. Could you forgive me? If I had a really good reason? This is Pauline, your father's new girlfriend. Actually, we've known her since high school, but I, I haven't seen her in a while. She's a great girl, you know. I'm sure your dad will be happy with her. She's one of those people who hasn't lost their sense of wonder growing up. In that regard, she actually reminds me of you. Your dad is still making video games, but he quit the big company he used to work for. Now he's making a game on his own. I don't know much about it. I think it's about you. In a way, every game he ever worked on talked about you. The games you were playing together actually gave him tons of ideas for his work. I thought Alex had gotten rid of that house when he cleaned out your room. After... you passed... I never wondered where it was. I just forgot about it. Some people say that the dead haunt houses. I was afraid that you would haunt that one. Afraid to hear your voice if I stared at it for too long. Alex moved into this place with his new girlfriend about a year ago. He looked happy. Suburban homes aren't my thing, but I was relieved that he had finally left the apartment where the three of us had lived. When I learned that Alex and Pauline were moving in together, I thought he had turned the page. Do you want to know what I felt? It's complicated. I think I was impressed. Once more, your father had demonstrated that 
he was stronger than me, and I'd like to say that I was happy for him. But in truth, I envied him. I pictured Alex alone in his office, using his job as an excuse to play with your house. I found that pitiful. That didn't fit at all with the idea I had of him, always moving forward, never moping around. And then I realized that maybe... Maybe he wasn't telling me everything about his feelings. Your father had everything. A new girlfriend, a nice house, his life on track. Meanwhile, I was over here, toiling, slowly crawling out of the hole. And I needed to see him so he could comfort me. Just like... Like before, I thought he owed me that. He started doing it at work, just so that he could meet his deadlines. Sometimes we did it together, at parties, for fun. Oh, all right, I know it's bad, but when we knew that you were coming, we stopped. And that's why I was surprised to see some at his place last week. He tried to hide it, but I laughed in his face. I'm not his mom. Still, though, I, well, I thought to myself it was a bad sign. Alex looked gaunt, N not just because of the blow, it was like, like he'd been crying. I, I tried to talk to him, ask him how he was doing. He just dodged the question, uh, so I insisted. But he said he wanted to show me something, and he started a video game. Something called Night Call, a murder mystery noir where you play a taxi driver. It was really good, but it's hard to have a conversation with a controller in your hands. We had a great night in the end. We drank beers, we played, we laughed. And after a while, he asked me what I was doing there, really. I thought about telling him the truth, but instead I, I kissed him. I don't know what came upon me. He kissed me. And more. It was... Very nice. Much more intense than it used to be before. And it made me want to cry because that was way too late. This whole stuck-in-nostalgia thing, I found it incredibly offensive. Perhaps I threw away the house to shake up Alex, to get a reaction from him, so he could be mad at me, so he could snap out of his lurch. Perhaps I threw away that house because that was my gift to him. Perhaps I thought he needed this old relic out of his life. Like he needed me out of his life. Perhaps I threw away that house because I was jealous of Alex's new life. In fact, I might have wanted to show your father what he was losing by losing us. I'm sure all of that contributed to my reaction to a certain extent. I was jealous, a bit petty, conflicted, and on top of that, I was a dollhouse thief. But there was something else, something that really hurt me, and that I'm only understanding now. I was ashamed.
I came to demand support from Alex. I thought it was unfair that he was already happy again. But when I came across that dollhouse, I realized that he missed you as much as I did, which is actually why I threw it away. That's the reason the dollhouse was proof that for years I had been blinded. I was ashamed to only realize now that he too was hurting. your pain, don't you think? How... how is this possible? How did I not realize that he was hurting too? And how come he never told me about it? Well, how about you, Alex? Should we talk about that? What? What do you mean? How many times have we talked about Astrid together? About her death. Dozens of times? Hundreds, maybe? That's because we needed to. I needed that. That was the only thing I could talk about, and Alex was always there to listen to me. To check how I'm doing. To inquire about my feeling. To assess my needs. To ask if there was anything else he could do. And I never asked him anything. Any questions? Not a single one. Are you sure about that? What do you mean, am I sure? You were devastated. And you? How did you feel? Come on, again with this shit. Pauline is always trying to make me talk to. I don't have anything to say. What am I supposed to say? There's no way you never felt the need to talk about those feelings. That whole time when you finally got me to calm down and fall asleep? How did you feel? What did you think? I... I, I don't know. I can't remember. Why are you dragging this up now? Because... I never thought to ask you back then. Well, that's all right. I... I'm okay. I was okay. It's not your fault. He's still doing it. He's still trying to protect me all the time. It... He needs to understand that things have changed. Yes, it is my fault. You were alone with your sadness. But now I'm thinking to myself that well, it wasn't fair. You know, I just realized something and I'm so ashamed about it. You're hurt too, and, and that didn't even occur to me until now. I was thinking about you. Not about Astrid? When I was alone that night, I was thinking about what I needed to do to help you get better. That's all I thought about. You needed me. That kept me going. And now that you're no longer here... I lived in fear of everything for a long time. Fear of making the wrong choice, fear of making mistakes, fear of not being good enough, not smart enough. And Alex was an antidote against all these fears. He was acting like he didn't have wounds of his own. But I knew that he did. One day, for instance, he told me about his parents. They love each other the same as ever. They're very good together. For them, having a child just came as a natural step to their relationship. They were nice, patient, kind. They ticked all the boxes. But in the end, parenting, that wasn't their thing. I think that in spite of their best efforts, they don't give a flying fuck about me. Maybe that's the reason why he, on the other hand, cared so much about us. Maybe your hugs and my kisses were the things that helped him cope. 
You can take care of yourself. All this energy you expended for me was admirable, but it was also holding you captive. You're free now. Free from what? Free to face your own emotions and deal with them, to heal your own pain. I... You know, if I ever think too much about her, about how much I miss her, I have to stop. It makes me dizzy, it scares me. Oh, I'm pathetic. Of course you're not. I understand. I'm trying to live with it, you know? But missing you on top of missing her, it's too much. I need you. Listen, Alex. How do I tell him? I'm going to hang up now. I blew off Jan to pick up the phone, thinking this was an emergency. But it is an emergency. I'm sure Jan will understand. Alex, you don't know! <sighs> Fine. The one time I need your help. Oh, poor guy. He's about to feel very bad about this. Oh well, that was his dumb choice. Alex, I'm at the hospital. Oh shit. Are you okay? What happened? Or was it Diane? Don't worry, I'm fine. And, and so is your dear Diane. It's my mother. She had... Uh... Oh. I should be happy that he's relieved, but man, that's harsh. But let's be honest, Alex has never been too keen on her anyway. Do you want to know how he described her? The mug of a James Bond villain, the personality of a public restroom, and the pictorial style of a drunken tardigrade. I'm sure he thought that she was being unfair to me, and that annoyed him. So he avoided her as much as possible. <laughs> the worst part is that she loved him. But he could see right through her. Marie's self-assurance, her way of looking down on everyone. Ah, he often told me that he wasn't buying it. That it was pretend. Alex didn't like that I wasn't as critical of Marie as he was. He probably thought that I was a bit um, masochistic. I wasn't. It's just that I'm her daughter. And she is my only mother. Alex, this is my mother we're talking about. I mean, sure, this is Marie, but still. What happened to her lady of the pen brush? I know it wasn't a heart. She doesn't have one. That doesn't sound like Alex. Not at all. What's happening to him? Is he drunk? It's a bit early to start drinking. Should I be worried? Or perhaps I shouldn't say anything. It's not funny, Alex. It's just... It's not funny. It's actually pretty insensitive. Which is not like you. Are you okay? Come on. It's just a joke. Except nothing is ever just a joke. Anyway, what do you care if I'm okay? Hmm? I mean, I care about you and <laughs> I... <laughs> oh, sorry. <clears throat> Are you doing a stand-up routine now? Hopefully that works out better than movies did. <sighs> right. I don't know what's going on, but I have no time for this, okay? So I'm just gonna hang up now. Yeah, you hang up. You can call me any time, day or night, even show up at my house unannounced. I'm here. No worries. But if it's the reverse, I can go right on to hell. That's unfair, Alex. I don't... Unfair? Think... Really? Have I ever not been there for you? What is that supposed to mean? Are we keeping score? That's news to me. I never asked you to be there. I don't owe you a thing, okay? Just call Pauline if you're looking for comfort. That's too easy, you know. Giving up on me now that you no longer need me. Mm, Alex, it's been almost two years since... What if I had done that to you when Astrid died? Oh, go fuck yourself, Alex! What a dumbass! How dare he bring you up in the middle of all this? 
He never forgave me for what happened, but he's too cowardly to tell it to my face. He's right, though. I don't know how I would have managed if he weren't there when you... And on top of that, I hold him responsible. I guess I'm an ungrateful bitch, huh? Oh, what? Hmm. Of all the stories I know, this is probably the least funny one. <laughs> Although it's not like any of this has been particularly fun so far. But sometimes, well, thinking back about darker things does help shine a light on them. And actually, I think this one ends well. All right? I'll tell you this story. Alex was a great dad who took good care of his child. He showered her, cooked her food, invented games for her. Any time the little girl was home, his deep laughter would shake the house's walls. And then, one day, Alex no longer feels like laughing. Astrid was both a little girl and a very big girl. When she turned four, she decided she would brush her own teeth. She was so eager to grow up. And then one day, Astrid disappears. Junon was a mom who had made a huge mistake. She had bruises everywhere, a broken arm, her skull was split. It wasn't a pretty sight, but Alex didn't mind and still took care of her. Junon was quite sure that she didn't deserve it. And then one day, she gets better. Marie was a grandmother who was often angry. As a result, she and Junon did not talk much. It was too exhausting. And then one day, Marie calls. Time passes, and Junon's body fixes itself. The bones heal, the bruises fade. Doctors call it a miracle. Junon doesn't agree. But these doctors are no good anyway. They didn't even notice that Junon's heart is strewn all around. Time passes, but a big little girl doesn't just disappear. She leaves toys and drawings lying around, and all kinds of fist-sized marks, like tiny little clenched fists punching holes into Junon's heart. Time passes, and the phone rings. Again, and again, and again. Junon doesn't know what Marie wants, but she can guess. Marie was there when Junon made her big mistake. And if Junon picks up, They'll have to talk about it. Junon can't forgive herself. So the phone rings, and nobody answers. Time passes, and Alex is still standing. He misses his daughter. 
He misses laughing, too. But he doesn't show it. He's taking care of everything. He cleans up, he cooks, he washes. He wants people to know that he won't crumble down. Marie keeps on calling. When the accident happened, Marie knocked her head. She looks like she's better now, but Junon is still thinking that she almost killed her. Her too, she might add, so she's not picking up. One day, Alex puts away every hint of Astrid into a big box. The apartment seems a bit empty all of a sudden. But it is what it is. And Alex isn't crying. Alex wants to rescue Junon from her sadness, wash her hair, Cut her nails. Spoon feed her. He wants to be the guy you can rely on to walk back home when you're tired. But today, Junon is not walking back. Junon doesn't want to be saved. Not by Alex. Not by anyone. She puts her finger through the candle flame to feel the bite. She wants to hurt. Just like that time. Broken bones and ripped up flesh. She's angry that her heart is still beating. Then one day... Are you sure you want to know the rest of the story, my little fawn? I hadn't prepared anything. I was just going to wash up. I had closed the door, taken off my clothes, turned on the shower, and I started crying. I couldn't stop. I couldn't go on. I had medicine for my broken heart. And I decided to swallow it all. Your toothbrush was on the edge of the bathroom sink, which made me think of my very big little girl. Her smile full of toothpaste. I thought that maybe I too could give it a try. 
But I had forgotten how to. I put those little pills in my mouth, and they tasted funny on my tongue. I just needed to swallow them. And right at that moment, the phone started ringing. Marie didn't ask me why I didn't answer the phone for a whole year. She started talking as if nothing happened. I was crying too much, I couldn't answer. So she told me she could wait. And she waited until the last tear was shed. And then she told me something she had never told me. Perhaps one day I can tell you exactly what it was. But long story short, it meant she loved us very much. You and I. In that moment, I felt like an enormous weight was lifted off of my shoulders. As if she had given me the most beautiful gift. And then she changed the subject. As she does. She had a proposal for me. Her career was taking off. And she needed someone to do the clerical work. She knew I would do it well. She told me, it's a boring job. I'm not doing you any favors, but you can do me one. I accepted. Alex never learned what really happened that day. He panicked because he could no longer hear me, so he broke the door. But he was too late. It was all over already. That's it, my little fawn. That's the end of my story. If it weren't for Marie, I wouldn't be here to tell you, because she gave me more than words that day. She helped me understand that it was time I made my own decisions. That's the thing I figured out that night. And it changed me for the better. I would no longer rely on others to save me. Not on Marie, not Alex, not anyone else. I couldn't live like that. Not anymore. Have I ever not been there for you? He didn't actually understand. He didn't get the dynamic we had and what it did to us. And me neither, actually. Up until today, I lived some sort of a misunderstanding. But it's over. It's true. You were there. Not just when we lost Astrid, you've always been there. I knew that whatever happened, you'd be there. It's not easy to explain why you fall in love with someone. There was no love at first sight between your father and I. We even lost touch after high school. And still. I went to university in Lyon, and he studied video games in Angoulême, across the country. We found each other again by chance, three years later, at a friend's party. We talked all night it was as if we had never been apart. At some point that night, we started making out. And I immediately knew that it would last. There was something in his eyes. I was really anxious at the time about everything. But when I woke up at his place the next day, for a brief moment, the oppressive feeling had disappeared. It happened again when I saw him the next day and the day after. And then after that, every time we met, in spite of the distance, I felt like I was taking drugs. And it was really good. I hated it. I felt like I could never live up to your composure. I was full of doubts, insecurity, anxiety. I, I was a waste of your time, Alex. I never thought so, ever. I know. Being with you was a gift. But it had to stop. After Astrid died. 
You see my little fawn? Even when you're gone, you're never very far. Even before, I was just letting you lead me around. When Astrid died, I did what I always do. I leaned on you. You would have the answer. You would know what to do. But... <laughs> But now, though, I understand. This whole time, your poor dad was fishing out corpses. Not literally. Don't worry, I'm not going crazy. It's just... It reminds me of this story I read while doing research for a screenplay. The story of a guy named Wei Peng, a farmer in the Yellow River Valley who found himself... a unique occupation. His cabin is 20 kilometers downstream from Lanzhou an industrial city that attracts poor folks looking for work. And their life is so terrible that a bunch of them are committing suicide. Young women, especially. Some kids and elderly too. More rarely, but it happens. Every morning, Wei Peng grabs his pitchfork, pops into his small boat, and he searches the river. He's looking for... Bulky and soft lumps. Most of the time, they're goat carcasses. But every now and then, he finds humans. When Wei Peng manages to identify the body, he sells it. Otherwise, he buries it. Between 500 and 5,000 yuan, depending on the client. I understood why people paid him. It's a horrible feeling not knowing what happened to a loved one. They were purchasing more than a mortal coil. They were purchasing peace of mind. But I didn't get why Wei Peng did it. How can you live with this job? Then I reached the end of the article. His own child died in that river. A kid your age, trying to retrieve a ball in the water. Wei Peng didn't know how to swim. He couldn't do anything. And now I understand Wei Peng. Just as I understand Alex. Some people find it easier to alleviate other people's grief than to deal with their own pain head on. Maybe that worked for you, being in that position. As long as you were taking care of me, you wouldn't have to think about yourself or about Astrid. Maybe I... I never... I never thought about it that way. <laughs> Me neither, you know, I, I only understand this now. Okay, then. Why? If I thought I was helping you, but actually hurting, why did you come back to see me? I really shouldn't have. I don't know what came over me. I was happy to see you again. Of course, I liked it too. But it also felt like a farewell. As tweaked to me that was just like before. Alex? Are you still there? <laughs> Marie had this weird rule back home. You only get to cry once. It didn't matter the reason, from bike falls to headaches to world hunger. She had this theory that there are two reasons one might cry. Either from surprise, when life sucker punches you, or from cowardice, when you give up on fighting back. You only get to cry once from surprise she used to say, and there is no time for cowardice. Well, I think she forgot that there was a third possibility. Sometimes you cry because you've mustered up the courage to look at life how it is. Are you okay, Alex? Oh, look at me, I'm about to win the contest. <laughs> what? What contest? 
The world's dumbest question contest. <laughs> oh crap, Gino, I'm so sorry. You don't owe me anything. I guess I should leave you alone. Yeah, well, I haven't exactly made it easy for you. But I'm not doing well, okay? Really, I'm not. Wow. You don't get these heartfelt moments from him, ever. Since last week? <sighs> Let me show you something. He wants to video chat. Oh, wow. This is, uh... Did I ever tell you the story of the lookout? It's a very special place for us. We were driving, Alex, you and I. It was a really hot day. Over 40 degrees. Okay, maybe not, but it was stifling in a car without AC. I remember that the sun was setting. I was eager to get home. I was just exhausted. So when you told me your tummy was hurting, I didn't really believe you. I remember clearly thinking, oh, she's okay. And then hearing the sound. Like snow falling from the top of a roof on the first warm day. Except it wasn't snow. It was the worst pile of vomit I had ever smelled. When he saw your face in the rear view, Alex knew he had to stop immediately. You looked truly positively puzzled. You were staring at the puddle beneath your feet, then looking around to see where it came from. And I was twisting and contorting from the front seat, but unable to help. I didn't even wait for the car to stop. I jumped out, went for your door, and squeezed you against me. I didn't care if I got dirty. I just wanted you to feel good. I thought it was my fault. I should have listened to you. Your forehead was hot. It could be serious. I carried you out to the banister on the end of the clearing and laid you on the grass. Your face was pale and your eyes were bulging and you started screaming. Oh, dear! You were vomiting, looking up, staring in the distance, screaming, Oh, dear! Oh, dear! Oh, dear! And I, I didn't understand. I kept asking you, what's wrong, baby? Patting your back, pulling your hair away from your face to help. And there was a pit growing in my stomach and my eyes were welling up. I was terrified and your dad was terrified. You were smiling. You pointed in front of you. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. So we turned around. And on the other side of the banister, there was a cliff going straight down. And down below, there was a prairie stretching between two leafy bushes. And in the middle of the prairie, there was a deer. I could have written this whole scene. He was standing tall beneath the sunset, as if holding it with his antlers. And he was looking at us, completely stunned. He was magnificent. Alex took a picture with his cell phone, and you kept repeating, a oh dear, a oh dear, clapping your hands when he finally jumped out into the bushes. Wow, we were in a daze, you know. We couldn't believe the beauty of what we'd just seen. And then you vomited one last time on your dad's shoes. And that day, you became the world's greatest deer fan, my little deer. What are you doing over there? Do you recognize the place? Of course I do. I'll never forget the lookout. Every time I take this road, I have to stop. The other drivers don't get it, of course. They ask me if I need assistance, if I broke down or something. I'm just trying to enjoy the view. It's so beautiful. Today I came here just for that. Why the sudden rush of nostalgia? Did you see the deer again? No. I never saw the deer again. I never see the deer again. And that really, really.
really sucks. Uh, Alex? You're scaring me a bit. You don't look well. I'm not well. You were right, you know. This whole time I thought I was helping you. I thought you needed me so you wouldn't crumble. But that was a goddamn lie. I was the one who needed you. Even before Astrid died, I needed you. Helped you know with her tyrannical mother, helped you know with her screenwriting career. Shows you know how to be happy. <laughs> a good one. It was easier for me to think you had issues. But I was the goddamn issue. It can't be easy for him to realize this. But he has to. At least I hope so. You are not an issue, Alex. And still, you got out as soon as you had the chance. I know you can be forgetful when it suits you, but that's pushing it. I remember getting in the car with you. I remember waking up in the hospital with Alex by my side. But what happened in between, it's a black hole for me. Apparently, that's pretty common. During extreme events, your brain does not generate memories. It's too busy surviving. I survived. Which I guess means that my brain worked really well. But since then, it's been mulling over this one question. Was it all my fault? I was half expecting your dad to hold it against me one day, anyway. But it doesn't hurt any less. <sighs> that was really shitty. I... I'm sorry. I'm just tired and sad. Do you want to know why I don't think about Astrid? The real reason? When I think about her, I say things to myself that hurt too much. That I will never see her again. That I will never hear her voice again. That I will never carry her to bed in my arms. How am I supposed to live with that? If only I had the answer to that question. It takes time. <laughs> yeah, that's it. It takes time. Except the more time passes, the worse it gets. And I'm getting tired of waiting. What are you saying? Alex, what are you saying? This place is as beautiful as ever, you know? Really beautiful. Bye, Jun. Good luck. Alex! Don't! Alex! Alex! Shit, I gotta get over there. Shit, Alex. I have a really bad feeling about this. Alex is strong, but... He didn't look well. I've never seen him like this. I could be imagining this, but if anything happens to him, I will never forgive myself. Oh, yeah. You did what? Oh, come on. I 
panicked. I just felt like something shady was about to happen. If you think I had any time to think, and also, I was drunk as a skunk, so... You're insane? Completely insane? You really think so? Uh, yeah. This is $3,000 whiskey. You could at least have saved me a glass. <laughs> You're so stupid. <laughs> I never felt the need to lie to your father. I always told him everything, because I felt like he understood me. I can't just ignore other people's judgment. I'm not strong enough. But with Alex, I never felt judged. Remember the first time we made love? How could I forget? Your arm got stuck as you took your shirt off, and you just stood there with your boobs out. That picture is forever etched in my memory. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Were you ever gonna come to my help? Certainly not. I had waited so long for that moment. I was relishing it. I will always love your father, you know. Forever. Being able to strip naked, completely naked, and feeling good anyway, that's rare. I hope that I will experience this feeling again one day with someone else. But I'm happy to have known that once in my life already. With him. All right, you settled? Uh, more or less. And what are you up to? Are you writing again? Shoot, Jan, how did you know? Lady, this isn't rocket science. You're just like mom. It's in your blood. Why do you think Alex has been pushing you all these years? You're the only one who's unaware that you're an artist. For a long time, I thought Alex was pushing me to write out of mercy, because he thought that it would somehow fill a void in my life. It had never occurred to me that maybe I was actually talented and that he had figured it out. It's time to say goodbye to your dad, I guess. I mean, farewell to us. I can no longer be with him because your absence would take up too much space. And also because I realize now that our relationship had something kind of unhealthy. But that doesn't take away from who he is or from what he gave me. Our story together is ending, but each of us still exists. And we're even stronger than before because we've grown up ready for a better rest of our lives. Shaken, transformed, rattled, but unbroken. How am I supposed to live with that? Today it's your dad who feels like his heart is in a million pieces. 
And this time, I'm the one who can help him understand that it's not all broken. I don't know. What happened to us was as unfair as it gets. I understand why it looks impossible to overcome. But I also know that you will find a way. That's who you are, Alex. You always find solutions. I'm actually trying to learn that from him. Do you remember my stalker? What are you talking about? The guy on Facebook who used to send me dick pics throughout the day? You told me you would take care of it and I was scared it would end up badly. It did end badly. For him. <laughs> I still have no idea how you found his mom and his dad's home address. I would have loved to see their faces when they unrolled their kids' dick poster size. <laughs> it wasn't cheap, but it was worth it. <sighs> You'll be all right, Alex. Sometimes you need to let go of things you thought would be forever. But you're still here. Unbreakable. And to be honest, Ponin is totally Eva Mendez. Come on, you're stupid. You know I'm not actually Ryan Gosling, right? Uh, just let me live my fantasies, please. Thank you, Juno. Do you think it was damaging? Us being together? Hmm, to each other or to ourselves? You know what they say about falling in love? It's just finding someone whose parents messed up in similar ways how your parents messed up. What about parents who messed us up, but we can't really put a finger on how? Do they count? They count double. They're the worst, just like the others. I'm sorry for what I said about Marie. I hope she gets better. <laughs> it's okay, Alex. I'm not going to blame you for always being on my side. Did you go see her? No, not yet. You should, because you never know. You're right. Of course he's right. Then why is it so hard? Genon, I need to tell you something. I know that you don't remember the accident, and I know you can't help it. And I know it's not fair, but... I resent you for that, and it scares me. I'd like to believe that knowing what happened that day wouldn't change a thing. But I know that's not true. Because there are only two options. Either my daughter is dead, or I killed my daughter. Scares. Yeah. Sometimes I feel really angry. I think that not knowing is driving me crazy. So if one day you do remember something, anything really, please tell me. I don't know if I will, but... I too would like to know. And I too am angry. Oh, Jun, I'm sorry I... Could you stop being sorry all the time? That is not sexy. Is Ryan Gosling ever sorry in the movies, huh? And what about Hugh Grant? Is he sorry, huh? Hey, Adam Driver? I mean, yeah. They do have that hangdog look. Uh, fair point. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to go, Jean. Don't do anything stupid, okay? What? <laughs> no way. I would never. Did I sound that depressed to you? A little bit, yeah. But I could be projecting. I just need to... I'm going to call Pauline, actually. Say hi to Diane for me. And... Good luck with your mom. It's going to be okay. I think so, too. I'll talk to you soon, Alex. Whew. What a conversation. But I think it really helped us. Really? Why couldn't we talk like this before? 
That depends on what before we're talking about here. Before you were born? Before you died? Or before we split up? Before we split up, I think we didn't feel like talking anymore. At all. Alex was paralyzed with fear. Talking about what happened made things too real. Me, on the other hand, I didn't know what was left to say. I miss you a lot, you know? Hey, what are you doing here? Did you follow me? It's forbidden to be here. Hey, wait! Where are these kids' parents? Come back! That could be dangerous! Oof. I haven't run this much since high school. Hey! Can you hear me? Hello? This kid, I swear.